What's up guys, Merry Christmas, and welcome back to another Daily Bible Reading Snapshot. Today we're looking at this little book of Haggai in the Old Testament, and then we're looking at Revelation chapter 16 in the New Testament. And although it seems like a random book to be reading in the Old Testament, I'm so glad we're reading this book because there's so much about the experience that people have on Christmas that is similar to the thing that Haggai calls out in this book. So it's so important for us to read it today and to take away some good application here. So Haggai, who is this person? Well, it's a prophet who's writing after the exile. So we've now skipped ahead in time. If we were at Zephaniah before, we were looking at the time of Josiah. That's before the exile. We're going ahead like over 100 years. So now the people of Israel have come back to the land. Some of them have started working on the temple of God. But the problem is they left the temple of God so that they could build their own houses. And that's the thing that Haggai calls them out for. He says, you guys are living in paneled houses. You're worried about all your upgrading, your features at your house, but you've forgotten about the house of the Lord. And that's what he gets into here in chapter one. And at the beginning of this, it says it's the second year of Darius the king. So there's a pretty clear date that this, this is taking place. This is probably 520 BC. So we think we have a pretty good date on when this took place. And it says that we've got some characters that are in the land. One guy that's important to know about is Haggai the prophet. Then also this guy named Zerubbabel, who was the person who was responsible for leading the Jewish people back to the land. So he's a descendant of David himself. So he's in the Davidic line there. Another guy, Joshua, who is the high priest at the time. So he's important too, and he's going to be important in the next book, especially the book of Zechariah that we're going to look at next. But anyway, it says, God had a word for them. He says, is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies in ruins, saying, you guys haven't built the temple. That's wrong. He says, consider your ways. Think about something. He says, you have sown much. That means you put a lot of seeds in the ground. But here's the problem. You have harvested very little. Interesting. It says, you eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. It seems like God is making things very difficult for these people. He says, he who earns wages does so to put them into a bag with holes. It's like someone takes all their money and pours it in this bag and then it all falls out and they lose all their money. What's the point? God is making things hard on them with their finances, with their food, with their clothing. He's making things difficult. And the question is, why is he making things difficult? He says, consider, think about this. You need to bring wood up to build the house of God. He says, you have built your own houses, but you're not building the house of the Lord. You love all the gifts that you've been given. God has given you so many gifts, but you haven't even thought twice about giving back to God. I think that's the reason why I made that, that connection earlier. Why is it important for us and even timely for us to read this at Christmas time? Because so many people on Christmas Day have a heightened concern about what they will get from other people without even having the slightest consideration about what they should give to God. And that's so important for us to make the connection. We cannot look at any of God's gifts and say, I'm going to take those gifts and not give back to God. We have to be people who give to God from whatever we have because God owns everything and God gave us everything. Everything belongs to him. So he says here, you need to see that one of the reasons why things are hard for you financially to these people is because they are refusing to obey God. So that guy has a very clear direction. He says, build, build this house. And then he says later on, he says, You'll, you look for much and behold, it came to little. When you brought it home, I blew it away. Why, declares the Lord, because of my house that lies in ruins, while each of you busies himself with his own house. Therefore, the heavens above you have withheld the dew, and the earth has withheld its produce, and I have called for a drought. So he's not even letting it rain because these people are not doing what they should do. And the reality is if they would only do what they're supposed to do and give generously back to God, God would have them be abundantly filled with things. But God says, no, not right now. So chapter two, he talks to them. They're starting to build a house. And one of the things he asked them is he says, hey, is this, is this a big deal? Is this house a big deal? And the reality was it was a lot smaller than the other houses that they built for the Lord. That specifically that one big house they built that Solomon was responsible for making. This house is so much smaller. And he says, look, my spirit is in your midst. And here's the thing. All the treasures of the earth will one day come to the temple. They will stream there. So don't worry. Don't look down on this. And then God says, the silver is mine. The gold is mine, declares the Lord. And the latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former. And he's going to give peace to this place. So God is going to do something with this temple where he's going to make the peace there abound in a way that it never has before. Question, has that taken place? Has the temple area been full of peace or been full of war? 
The answer is it's been full of war, even from the time that they rebuilt it. They were opposed. They had little tiny bits of peace, but they never had this peace that was greater than anything that we've seen before. I think because Haggai's looking to the future and God is going to give them a promise for the future. Now, it says, interesting thing here in Haggai chapter 2, he says, I've got glory for this future temple, but the problem is the people are defiled, but God has a plan for them, and he'll describe what that looks like. And then, as he's describing this, um, we see here that he calls um, this one guy, Zerubbabel, this king figure, like a signet ring on God's hand. He says, he is going to be this so important of a character here, that it's going to be like he's God's special ring and you know like a kingly ring that he wears that shows his power what is this looking forward to well Zerubbabel certainly was important he was sort of powerful but not really this was such a small kingdom this is looking forward to the future whenever we see pictures of Zerubbabel and Joshua this king figure and this priest figure we also need to see in them them pointing forward to Jesus which we're going to see later so why is it important to read Haggai on Christmas because we need to consider what are we giving to God if we're so concerned about busying ourselves with our own house while we neglect our church or neglect the work that God is having us do, even with our finances, we're in the wrong. And God says, repent from that. So the book of Haggai is important for us for many reasons. But um, as we turn to the New Testament, we're looking at Revelation chapter 16 here, where God is going to tell the world that this is how I'm going to judge you. And we get this book, and it's awesome because we get to see the judgment that God's going to do in the future before it happens. But there's seven bowls here of judgment, which we've already seen seven seals. We've seen seven trumpet judgments. Now we see seven bowls. And these are really quick, I mean, one verse at a time, basically, describing judgment that God's going to bring on the earth. So first of all, the people are going to get harmful sores, like the people of Israel, or like the people of Egypt back in the ten plagues. Then it says the sea is going to become blood and everything's going to die. Again, very similar to the 10 plagues. Then it says the springs of water, not just the salt sea, but also the springs, the, the fresh water, that's going to become blood too. And in the midst of this, in the middle, verse 5, 6, and 7, we see people praising God. We see a praise of God. You are just. You're the Holy One of Israel. You are the one who is and who was. You brought these judgments, for they have shed the blood of the saints and prophets. It is what they deserve. Again, yesterday we talked about the theme in Revelation of praising God for the judgment he brings. That's a foreign concept to a lot of us, but we need to get used to that and comfortable with that in the Bible, that God calls people to praise him for even his acts of judgment against evil people. So then he goes on. Bowl number four says the sun is going to scorch people and they're going to be lit up on fire and people are going to be burned. Um, and it says even after that, they won't repent. People will see these judgments going on, and instead of turning to God, they will harden themselves in their own sin. Then, bowl number five, it says the land goes into darkness, which reminds us again of what happened in the ten plagues. It says these people are full of the sores. They've got all these other judgments. It's not like they all, you know, stopped and they ended and then it's the next one. It seems like they just kind of pile on top of each other. So one of the things it says is in the darkness, these people can't find any light. For some reason, something goes on where they're, they're all blinded. They can't find the light, so it says they gnaw their own tongues in the pain of the sores that they have. If you can imagine what it's like to have a really bad sore, maybe you've had it in your mouth or you know on your body somewhere, on your arm or your leg or whatever, and it's a really bad sore, imagine all that in the darkness. It says the people will just chew on their own tongues because they'll, they'll be in so much pain here. And it says in chapter uh, 16, in the middle of this chapter, bowl number six of wrath, we see that the waters of the Euphrates River are dried up so that the beast can take these demonic forces in. And you got to read it. It's interesting. It says these demonic forces come. There's three unclean spirits that are like frogs somehow. Um, again, don't know all of what that's going to look like. We just know it's here and it will make sense when it takes place. But verse 15 is an interesting little light spot in all of this, this darkness. It says, Behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake, keeping his garments on that he may not be going about naked and be seen exposed. The whole idea is it's like Jesus talking. It's like he's saying, hey guys, remember, I'm coming like a thief. My judgments are coming fast. Make sure that you stay awake. And it says they assembled at this place called Armageddon, which Old Testament word for that is the, the plain of Megiddo um, that we see in Jerusalem or in the land of Judah still today. Not Jerusalem, it's outside of Jerusalem to the north of it. Uh, then the seventh bowl takes place and God says, it's done, I'm going to, give an earthquake, this city's going to split, and the hundred pound hailstones are going to fall. And he says, the favorite line there is, it's done. This is done. The judgment is now taking place. And over the next couple of chapters, we see the same 
final judgment described, I think, in some different ways. So this is really approaching the very end here when that seventh bowl of judgment is poured out. So a lot of judgment here in Revelation today, and that's important because we always want to take seriously any claim that God makes, because any claim that he makes is a promise. If he says it's going to happen, it's as good as done. So as we see this predictive prophecy about the future, what we need to take away is not trying to, to figure out what the, the frog thing looks like and, and all that stuff. What we need to say is they responded incorrectly when they refused to repent of God's, uh, they refused to repent in God's judgment, where the angels do what is correct. They praise God because he has done what's right. So even when God brings judgment, we need to remember, step back and say, God is doing what's right in the end. So we need to be thankful that God is a God who's just and holy and who always does what's right. And we're thankful for that. And even this Christmas day, I know this I mean, second half of this wasn't very Christmassy, but we need to be thankful that God is just, that he sent his son uh, so that in Jesus, Romans 3 says, he can be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Christ. And we're thankful that Jesus came on Christmas day to save us from our sins. So with that in mind, Praise God for that, and have a good day celebrating. See you back tomorrow for another Daily Bible Reading Snapshot.